Welcome to One Insight. My name is Rich Litvin. I grew up in London and I now live in LA. And this is a podcast for extraordinary top performers. You see, I've coached some of the most successful and talented people on the planet. I see what most people cannot see, and I dare to say what most people wouldn't dare to say. And what I know about success is that on the other side of it, it can actually be lonely. You can feel like more of an imposter the more successful you become. And when you're the most interesting person in the room, you're actually in the wrong room. I coach around insight. Life looks one way, something happens, the world looks different, and your entire world changes. It can happen in an instant. And this podcast is called One Insight because a single insight can change everything. I'm looking forward to today's conversation because I'm talking to three interesting people. One of the entrance requirements for a program that I run called 4PC, which is for high performing leaders and coaches, is that you should be a little bit in awe of us and we should be a little bit in awe of you. And that's how I feel today. If there's something about each of my guests today that has me say, wow, or have the thought, how did you do that? So I know that I'm going to be speaking to Tony in a moment. And Tony, you have not only have a financial consulting business, but you were the financial leader for a billion dollar, dollar launch for an organization you worked for. I'm going to be talking to Sarah. And Sarah, I know you've got a PhD in archaeology that you've got at 27 years old. And then going down this path, you just knew it wasn't the right one for you and said, I'm going to go in the direction I really feel called to go in. And I'm going to be speaking to Monica, who for 28 years led teams and worked in the corporate world. In fact, went to teams of up to 20, 250 people she was in charge of, bringing in sales of more than 10 million euros every year. So there's something about each of you that's very different and has me go, wow. And I have no doubt that just like me, you have your doubts, your fears, your insecurities. And probably if you're human, as you heard me say the things about the other people who are guests on this podcast today, you were thinking, wow, it's impressive what they're up to. But on the inside, like, well, I, it's just what I do, right? There wasn't, because the problem with being in our zone of genius, doing that thing that we just do effortlessly, is it feels effortless. So we can hear the acknowledgements from the people around us. It doesn't really land. It doesn't mean so much. I'm glad you're here. Let's play. Sarah? Hi. Hi. What would make this an extraordinary conversation for you today? I love this question. Um, I think it refers back to what you just said, actually really seeing my own brilliance. Yeah, seeing my own brilliance. Hmm. I, I believe in something called the fraud paradox. When it comes to imposter syndrome, we've all heard of it and we all hope that finally one day we'll get past imposter syndrome. Finally, we'll fit in. We know we're meant to be in this room. I don't believe in that game. I, I hope for you, Sarah, that you never quite see your own brilliance. You always feel a bit of an imposter and a bit of a fraud because it will mean you keep you continue to put yourself in rooms where you feel you don't fit in. Yeah, that's, it's almost like the, the imposter syndrome, it kind of spurs me on to do things to, yeah, to put myself in places that I, yeah, that, exactly that. Yeah. Let's catch. So I, I, mm. I know that you moved to Portugal. You took a real risk, you moved from England to Portugal. Yeah. You met someone you fell in love with. You started a business nine months ago and you're, you're, you're oversubscribed. You're fully booked. Yeah. yeah. So, so whilst I could work with you on doing the things I need to do to have you get your own brilliance, just so you know, I get it over here. Okay. Yeah. And when you, when you say that back to me, I'm like, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. We, we have a ground when you're rule living in it. If obviously we have a ground rule, your job is to believe that everything positive anyone ever says about you is true. That's beautiful. 
Well, thank you, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Three minutes? A an insight happens in a moment. And, and whilst we could do deep inner work on you doing more around your beliefs in yourself, sometimes we don't have to. Just that mm. shift in where we're looking changes everything. And maybe in a few moments, we'll, we'll go deeper and see where else you want to go today, Sarah. Perfect. Thanks for that. Thank you. Hey, Tony. Hello. Hey, hey. How should we play today, Tony? Uh, there's so many plays we, we can go. Um, I have been thinking a lot about um, the more of less and um, how I use my time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I started coaching, I had so many things that I wanted to do and still have so many great ideas of, of directions to take. And just started grabbing at them, like just saying, I'll do all these things. And now um, I've come to the realization that um, I need to clean the slate mm. and focus on the things that are gonna be the most impactful for me. And that's, and that's the mindset I'm in right now is, is trying to be really focused on the things that are gonna be the most impactful to make me happy, but also make my business the most um, and you know, the most flourishing business it can be, but it's not just the business, but to make an impact on the people I want to make an impact every day. I've clarified my, who I am speaking to. Mm. Um, and it's become more and more clear, which is amazing. Nice. Nice. Well, we spent time together at one of my intensives recently. So I see you're putting that into practice. Yeah. And here's the paradox though, right? I, I, I believe in this, um, less but better is a less. phrase that comes from uh, uh, the, the book. Oh, what's the, <laughs> yeah, the book escapes me. Uh, nope, can't get it. Uh, th this idea about slowing down to speed up yeah. changed my life. I'm the guy who always hustled to make stuff happen, worked really hard. I know how to play that game. Yeah. And slowing down to speed up has changed everything. But here's the paradox. I want to focus on the things that are most impactful, you said. Yeah. The problem with that is, how do you know what's going to be most impactful? Exactly. Exactly. So I love a concept I call small bets. I'm taking small bets all the time. And to use the poker metaphor, when something begins to take off, then I'll double down but I'm constantly taking risks. You were at my intensive recently when I said to the room, I've noticed there are at least 50 out of the 150 people in this room who are leaders, who come from a corporate background, who are executives. I'm gonna do something just for you guys tomorrow evening if you'd like to join me. And yeah. then I'm gonna try and sell you something that doesn't exist yet. Because I just had this idea, well, I could create something for that group of people. So they came to the room, I served them as powerfully as I could, coach people, taught stuff. And at the end said, here's my idea. And it was an idea to work with a, a small group of leaders in that way to help them build a coaching practice. Mm -hmm. It was a small bet. I just threw out an idea. It didn't even exist. Uh, where's yeah. my post? I have I had this little card in my hand and, and I read from this and I'm turning to the other side and going, oh, that's it. That's all I had, just a couple of ideas. Two people went to the back of the room and said, can we join? We want to pay. It didn't exist yet. So now I knew it was real. And then I went away and thought about it and designed it. And it became this thing that I've called Project Kairos. And we've already sold, I think, 14 out of 20 seats have gone within two weeks. It was a, a small bet, though. If no one had been interested, I wouldn't have done anything with it. Now it's become a thing. And people know I'm running this program, but it didn't exist before. So I'm... I love the idea that you want to focus on the things that are most impactful. In order to do that, you also have to focus on putting a lot of stuff out into the world and seeing where there's something of interest. Yeah. That, that insight is really important to me because you, it has to be small. You can't overcommit because once you overcommit, you can't do anything nice. well if you try to do too much. You know, um, it's great to do a lot, but you got to do a lot relatively well. <laughs> so you can't do a lot of stuff crap in a very um, you know, poor way. Yeah. 
it has to be it has to be done with a way that is intentional with intention if you just do it that, that's that's that phrase i started with less less but better and that comes from the book i've just remembered um, essentialism yes and, and yes. so this idea of less but better it allows you to to do more so i was speaking to a friend who runs a 40 million dollar business the other day super successful entrepreneur and said i'm an accidental entrepreneur i was a high school teacher for the first part of my career i didn't know anything about business and then i became an entrepreneur and because i didn't know about business i've had a one-line business plan for over a decade for almost 15 years meet fun and interesting people Every time I do that, my business flies. Mm. When I don't do that, sometimes it struggles, sometimes it, it thrives, but, but it, it, it drains me of energy. The reason the three of us are talking is that you fit my filter of fun and interesting people. And so whenever I do that, I don't know how the business is gonna fly, but it does. And he said, thank God you weren't trained to be a business person. And I have a, I have a number of those heuristics, rules of thumb that help me create a great life and a great business. So slow down to speed up is one of them. Meet fun and interesting people is another. Here's a third. Money is the most perfect expression of my creativity. Money is the most perfect expression of my creativity. So if it, it, it blows my mind, you guys, that if I go to a bank to ask for a loan for a mortgage, I'm seen as high risk because I'm an entrepreneur. If we have a friend who works in an organization, they'll get a mortgage very quickly. But I know because I've worked in organizations and lost the job, but I've had many friends who've been fired from organizations. That's not a safe job. But as entrepreneurs, if we want to create money, we just get creative and money comes. You can't always guarantee the time frame, but if you're someone who gets creative enough, money's going to come back because I have a belief for me I'm not saying you have to take this one on. This is one of the rules of thumb, how I use to create my life. Mm -hmm. Money is the most perfect expression of my creativity. That's great. I, really, I like that. Money has been the challenge in my mindset and, and just kind of putting it in that frame helps me to think differently about how I should look at it. So. Well, it, it, Almost ironic, and not quite, that the man yeah. who understands how to manage billions of dollars exactly. for other corporations, other organizations, is challenging to do it for ourselves. Yeah. Which is exactly why coming into this world of uh, entrepreneurship has been challenging because um, I think it's almost like an embarrassment in a sense. You feel like you're embarrassed to feel like you don't have a good handle on your relationship with money. Uh, whereas when you were in your prior world, that was like your job <laughs> to, to, to be uh, in good harmony with, with money because that's what you did. You managed money. And, um, okay, so let me play with you on that one. So first of all, it, it, it's, I get why it might feel like an embarrassment. Over here, what I see is so often in our world, we teach what we most need to learn. Exactly. Of course you understand this for others when it's hard to apply it for yourself. It's why I have coaches. I can't do this stuff that I do for others for myself. Mm -hmm. So it might be beneficial for you to have people in your world who can help you with your money stuff. And here's one other trick you can play, which is to have one day a week when you become Tony's money manager. <laughs> when one day, two hours, you go somewhere nice, a hotel near where you live, and you sit in a beautiful space, and you look at Tony dispassionately. Okay, what does this guy most need to know? If Tony was my best client, what would I teach him about money? What would I tell him to stop doing? What would I have him do more of? If every week for a year, you became Tony's manager, Tony's money manager, for one or two hours a week, and you answered those three questions alone, Tony's world would change. And by coincidence, so would yours. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it's just not just the money manager, probably a, a bunch of other managers that I need um, to have to help me manage through a lot of things that are happening. So that's great. Yeah. Well, so again, less but better. Slow down. Yeah, absolutely. We all need a board of directors with people who have different qualities and skills. 
but it's so tempting. Here I give you this idea that could change your world and you're ready to say, okay, well, I love that idea, but I also need all these people on the team. Yeah. And suddenly you've lost, let's slow down. What if you made that commitment for yeah. the next 90 days? Do that one thing alone. You can see that, but that's how I'm wired. I, I quickly move to the next idea. Um, it's funny how you pick that up. Um, but you I want to know why I, I picked that up because it's yeah. my struggle. Like <laughs> you guys know that one too. You have yeah. success for a moment, and you're already looking at like how I should have done it better or bigger or differently or what I should do next. Yeah. Course, while we're talking, right? You're my people. I'm your people. We get each other. Yeah. It wasn't hard to pick up because I see the reflection of me and you. Yeah. But I, I think the commitment of this that one, you know, the finance manager is, is the key. My financial advisor, Tony, is going to help me on an ongoing basis. So nice. I love it. Thanks, Tony. Thank and you. What do you get from either of those conversations for you, Monica? An insight, a thought? Uh, I really loved your advice uh, for Tony to. Um, uh, be his financial advisor once per week and uh, 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 that's for sure that I will do this because I'm uh, creating so great business strategies for all my customers but I, I never do it for myself I never saw this perspective so I really really loved it and I was smiling uh, du during your call with um, during your talk with uh, Tony and uh, I saw myself in a nice hotel and uh, doing this. Uh, so yeah, yeah, great advice. Yeah. Beautiful. How about for you? What, what would make this an extraordinary conversation for you? Uh, also, as you said before, I want to go with many stuff. Uh, I was all my life a leader. Uh, I enjoy uh, doing a lot of things. And, uh, uh, but I, of course, I fear of failure. And um, going all in with this coaching business uh, in the last month. Well, so let, me, let me slow you down for a second. Let yeah. me slow you down. You said, of course, a fear of failure. So we, we have to listen closely to our clients' words and, and hear the way that they're creating their world. Why, of course, I'm wondering over here, because what I've seen in my life is that the more times I fail, that's the path to success. Uh, if I look back in my life, I sometimes get interviewed and people say, what would you do? What advice would you give to a 20 year old rich? Uh, what would you tell him to stop doing or not to do? And I always think that's a lazy question because I, I wouldn't tell him to do anything differently. Like all the struggles and fails I've had on my path got me here. If I hadn't failed at that thing back there, maybe I wouldn't be here. And so, I bet that's true for you too, if we slow down enough to check it out. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, but um, I still continue to wonder sometimes, what if I fail? What if I go all in and uh, something will not be uh, exactly as uh, I thought? But what, this so, so let me slow you down again. Let yeah, me sorry. slow you down again, so I'm, I'm really, listening very close to what you said. Yeah. I sometimes wonder, well, what if I fail? Well, we have these, these thoughts and they're, rhetoric, they're, they're, they're rhetorical questions in our mind, but it's not a rhetorical question. You can answer it. A rhetorical question is a question we sit with and sit with and sit with and never have an answer. I sometimes have this question in my mind, what if I fail? What if you answer that question right now, Monica? What if you fail at the next thing you're up to? Then what? Okay, then I will try other things because I have 10 in my mind already. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> right. so, so, I think sometimes we, we, are, we have that question, what if I fail? And what it means is, what if I fail at everything? And then I end up homeless and having to live on the street corner. Instead of, what if this project doesn't work? What if this thing doesn't work here? I mean, I've, I've had employees who I've hired and they had to fire because they weren't right for my team or someone did something that was out of integrity. I've made mistakes in business. I grew my team to 10 people a year ago, which felt amazing and I was scaling and then it became overwhelming and it wasn't the right direction and I've 
scaled back down, which feels energizing and exciting. These weren't mistakes. These were things I needed to do along my journey to find out my path. But we don't do it. We, are, we ask the question in our head, what if I fail? And secretly we mean, what if I fail at everything and my life is a disaster? And just answering that one question, there's a sense of relief in you. There's a smile in you. Yeah, oh yeah, what if I fail? I'll do what I always do. Pick myself off, up, dust myself down, try something else. I just feel so relieved right now, really. <laughs> it, 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 suddenly, yeah, I really slowed down. From, for one moment, I said, yeah, exactly. It, nothing could happen because if I fail with this, I can do so many other things. Yeah, thanks. That's beautiful. So I, I know before this call, you were excited. You said to me, like, I want my life-changing insight. And, and insights can happen in a moment. They really can. And when you've had it, life has shifted. Now, the thing about a life-changing insight is that whilst I have absolute confidence, I can speak to anyone. And in a conversation, they'll have a life-changing insight because of how I'm listening to them, because how I'm willing to challenge their thinking, because of how I'm willing to be still enough to find out what's really going on, not what they say is going on. The insight alone isn't enough. It's what you do with it that will change your life. So what might be really valuable for you over the next 30 days is at the end of every day, maybe before bed, there's a piece of paper on your nightstand and you answer the question, what did I fail at today? So you can really build that muscle of knowing it's okay to fail. And, and have a laugh at it and have a smile with it. I have a ritual with my kids. My kids are five and seven. And every night at dinner, we sit down, we have a ritual. We say, what was the best bit of our day? What was the most challenging bit of our day? And what's something we're grateful for? And, and why we do the first two is to have a look at, you know, it's possible every day to create something great. And it's possible to face challenges every day and still be okay. And even at five and seven, I want them to get that to be part of their world. Yeah, great. I will do this. Beautiful. Let me come back to you, Sarah. Thanks, Monica. Thanks. An insight, a thought from anything that's happened so far or the question that you want to dive into next? Mm. Well, really listening to Monica, the notion of surrender really came up and that's something that I've been really contemplating over the past couple of months this idea of really allowing myself to surrender um, I think as well you said that you can mess with the time frame and that for me is such a relief because old Sarah would be trying so hard to make something happen by a certain date and if it didn't happen it was almost like okay that's I'll throw it away, I'll throw it out. And listening to Monica and listening to your words, I have this sense of what if I just keep going? And what if the time frame is just completely abandoned and I just keep doing what I love and surrender, almost surrender to what I love? Nice. Yeah, you know, as humans, we are really poor estimating time so we tend to really underestimate what we'll accomplish in 10 years and we overestimate what we'll accomplish in one year and whenever i say that to people i get a nod and then i say look back 10 years ago imagine when i was talking to you 10 years ago looking into the future and you could see what you're going to accomplish would, would you have had any idea that those things were coming would you have even known to were they even on your goal list 10 years ago no, not at all. I was, you know, 10 years ago, I was just fin finishing my undergraduate. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. And, and I was a completely different person. So the, the goal post changed. And then we get to now and then we, now, cause we, we see so much in the media about goals and how important they are. And so we think we fall into this trap of thinking, well, I need to set goals for what's happening next. Mm. A goal is okay for a project. If you're launching a program, you want to have three new clients, those are projects. That's okay to put a goal on that. But, but I, I'm, I've realized over the years that I kept falling into the trap of thinking I had to set goals. And what I would do, I would write them on pieces of paper and then I'd find them months or years later in a drawer somewhere, the back of a drawer crumpled up and I'd pull it out and go, oh, accomplished that one. 
done that one, done that one. Didn't do that one, but it's not relevant anymore. Didn't do that one, but I've forgotten about it anyway. Accomplish that one, accomplish that one. So I don't, I don't set goals in that way any longer. What I've realized is I'm an opportunity seeker. When there are opportunities, I do what I said to Tony, I take small bets. There's about half a dozen small bets I'm taking right now. And I have no idea if we speak in a year's time, which if any of them will become something real and exciting and fun for me. I've got a potential to partner with a friend to create million dollar clients. I've got a potential idea that I'm working with, with, with somebody to create a, an online program that I've never done before for senior level leaders and executives who are transitioning into coaching. I'm, I'm constantly playing with ideas and, and I take small bets. I don't go full in until I see some energy starting to build and then I'll invest a bit more energy and a bit more. Yeah, I love that. And if I think back to what my goals were as a 21 year old, I mean, very, very different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because what yeah. do we know at that age about what we want? We, we don't know. We, and we have to go through what Monica say, says she's afraid of, all those failures along the way, because they give us the lessons. It's never a Absolutely. failure if you learn from it. And Absolutely. one of the problems with success is that when we fail, we tend to turn around and see what can we do differently to avoid it next time. When we succeed, we tend to just keep going. And it's a really powerful, I'll leave you guys with this thought. It's a really powerful exercise each time you have a success in life to pause and take a breath and slow down and say, how did I create that? What did I make happen? Why did I do this? So that you can build on that success too. All right. Thank you for trusting me, the three of you. I love playing this game. Insight does happen in a moment and then life simply shifts. And there is a place where it's really powerful to capitalize on an insight, to reflect on it. So one of the most powerful tools we have as coaches, I call gentle reflection. It's the time between the conversations. So it's the time between now and the time each of us might speak next that we'll see what occurs. Did you do anything with that insight? Did it shift? Did another insight come after that one? How are you making that real? How did you fail? Where did you succeed? And then we talk again and we see what happens. And that's the power of working with someone over time. And it's really fun with, for me to work with someone like this in the way I've worked with each of you today. So thank you so much for trusting me. Thank you for playing with me. Bye for now. For most of human history, it wasn't called coaching. It was called leadership. And it's what I love to do to coach people, to lead people, and to mess with people's thinking. If you'd like more of this, or if you'd like to learn more about our community of extraordinary top performers, go to richlitvin.com forward slash one insight.